All right, I'm gonna continue with the UEFI development here. Where I left off, I'm just reading a basic text file from the data partition on the disk image, but I wanna to change to read a binary file, something that could be used as an OS kernel or some other program that you'd wanna load. So I'm gonna to change to do that in this one. I'll probably try to load an ELF, a portable executable or PE, the Windows file format, and just a plain flat binary, maybe starting off with that because it's a little easier. We don't have to worry about loading program sections or anything. But I want to I want to change to where we can actually load a program that could be an OS kernel, right? Make this thing more of a bootloader. So I'll get into that. So right now, if I go into the right folder, <laughs> right now there's nothing to really make. I have this I called it load kernel, but all it does is load a test file that says testing. So I'm going to change this menu function to load the kernel instead of doing that. So that has gotten. When the disk image is made, it loads this test.txt from the data partition, and that's added in from calling the right GVT program in the other folder here, passing a file to add to the data partition. And I pick that up through that menu option, and it loads it on the screen. So let's make a kernel instead that I want to load for that. I'm going to add it to the make file. So instead of, the, instead of this test.txt file, let's say we have a kernel, and we can make it one of these things down here, which I forgot I added. So <laughs> one of these, I'm just going to have these be kernel, and then you can just basically choose which one you want to do. Choose your own adventure style. And whichever one is made, I will make targets for each of these file formats, and then we can just put that in to have it automatically be made in the make file. So instead of test file here, we can say kernel. And then for each of those targets, each of these file formats, I can just make something here like kernel.bin. We'll say it needs kernel.c as a source, and that, that'll be fine. So I'll have elf and pe files as well, but I'll add those in as I add the code to do that later. So to make a flat binary, it's pretty easy. It's a little bit, well, you'll need two separate steps probably for making a portable executable into a flat binary, which should just be copying the text or the actual executable code from an object or from an executable, just extracting that singular text section of the executable into a separate file for the binary. So that's all I'm really going to be doing. So I'll just put that here. I'll say flat binary. This will be for Clang. I'll probably make a different one for GCC just because I can't directly output format from the linker, I can't directly output a binary format for portable executables. For some reason, the ELF-based linker is fine, but not PE-based linkers for some reason. So I'll say MinGWGCC is gonna be there for PE files, and we'll say this will be for ELF slash Clang, or regular GCC if you're not using that, but anyway. So I'm going to do C files. Well, I'm going to do C flags, the regular C flags I'm already using, these ones up here, basically. So it will add an extra file probably for the dependency. That's fine. We'll add all extra pedantic, no red zone, freestanding. That's okay. The linker flags, I have no standard lib. So I'll probably, yeah, I'll continue adding those in, but I'll do that manually to not step on those. And to force a portable, well, to force a position independent executable so I don't have to worry about linking sections to specific addresses, it'll be easier to just go with pi <laughs> files here. And I like pi, it's pretty tasty. You can also set pi for the objects that will be made into a flat binary file. Whether the actual flat binaries are position independent, they should be. They should work with offsets from, uh, in 64-bit, the rip, rip relative addressing, so the instruction pointer or otherwise just refer to offsets for jumps and things and not strict absolute addressing. So hopefully that works out. We can disassemble and look at it if you want. That's fine. But that should be all right. That's the only other thing there. If I want to directly set an entry point, which I probably will for a freestanding file, I'll do that. But let's make the object first. So kernel.c is going to be the source file here. And I'll make that into an object. We'll say kernel.o. And then as the second part, I'll use a linker, whatever I have on here. I'll probably set a different entry point, let's say kmain for kernel main. And for ld flags, I want to do no standard lib, and whatever other ones I had up here, that's probably it. 
and I'll do that for kernel.o. I can set the output format for this linker for a an, e an ELF file format. It'll work by setting a binary output format directly. And we can say kernel.bin is going to be the output, which is the name of this target. So I can just do dollar at sign. And that'll be all right. So then I'm just going to copy that into the other thing here. And I'll probably make a make target for this as well. Because that would be easier than typing the same thing every time if we want to change it in one place. So I'll just copy the target into there and that'll be all. So when I make the actual thing, instead of the test file, I'll make the kernel file, which will be kernel.bin. Which will go ahead down here and make this. So I guess this I could call kernel bin, depending on what it is. Hmm. Or well, just the regular kernel, but if I want it to work for each separate one, yeah, these will probably have to be separate targets. So I think that's all I have to do for that. I do have to make this sort of source kernel file first, but I think that'll work. Let me make the, the disk image thing as well. I'll just set the folder here as a separate target so I don't have to keep writing this. Which should be what that is. Yeah. I guess we'll say if you're on Windows, they use backslash instead of forward slash. So I'll just set that up for later, just in case. But that way this can be a little more dynamic, or at least you only have to set it in one place and not worry about what it is down here for the actual targets. So that might be a little bit better. Maybe more succinct, but anyway, we'll make this kernel file here. And let's say I want to pass in the graphics output protocol and just pass in like the frame buffer info so I can draw to the screen just to prove that we can load and run a file and that it works and does something. I'd have to make a custom font to print text. So a little bit easier is just drawing pixels to the screen that's passed in as an example. So to have the definition for the GOP, I'll include EFI.h. And I should already have standard int in there, but I'll put it in here anyway in case I want to use fixed width types. So we'll say this is going to be a standard, or a sample, rather. Say this is a sample kernel file for testing. Could change it later, and that's all right. So depending on what I want to return, we could return an int, or we could just never return from this. I'll say right now it'll never return, and for the calling conventions to line up, since UEFI uses the Microsoft ABI, I'm going to use that as well, which I have defined as EFI API, that, that symbol within EFI.h. That's, uh, that's right here. So attribute msabi, that just sets up the calling convention that UEFI uses. And if UEFI, that application is going to call this kernel program and load and run it, I want to make sure that the calling convention lines up. So I'll use the same thing there. So what do I want to take in for this? I'll call it kmain because that's what I'm going to link it under. Uh, I don't really know. I'll have a type def, I guess. I want to include other things later, probably like the memory map and other stuff. So right now, I'll just set up a basic type def that I might add into EFI.h or elsewhere. Let's say we have a, a kernel parms struct, for lack of a better word. I'll say we have a memory map later on. Right now it'll be empty. And I'll say we have the, the graphics output protocol, probably mode. Which is, yeah, that is the thing. I'll say that's a GOP mode. That'll be a struct, not a pointer. The memory map will probably be an array, so it can be a pointer, but this I'll just have the struct itself. And this will take in kernel parms. So if I want to draw to the screen, I'm going to search for that to get it over here. So the output protocol mode is a pointer within the graphics output protocol, but it contains this info. And I needed the mode itself for the frame buffer, so I know where that's at. So I can set up, like, each pixel is probably going to be 4 bytes. So I'm going to assume we have a 4 byte pixel here. So I'll say we have a frame buffer pointer that's going to be 4 bytes at a time, set equal to that frame buffer, frame buffer base value. So that'll be within the kernel parms here. Let me give that a name, like kernel args for kernel arguments. Or k parms, but I figure when you call it, it's arguments, but that's pedantic semantics. So anyway. I'll we'll have kernel args, that is a struct, not a pointer. So I'll get the GOP mode from that, and we'll get the frame buffer base from that. And I'll just set a pointer to that. 
And then if we want to draw to the screen, we'll probably want to use an X and Y value as offsets into that frame buffer. So I'll just make those four byte values as well, probably. Yeah, so we'll do that. I'm trying to think. Uh, oh, we, we can get that from the info here. Yeah, so we can dereference to get the info. The info will have the vertical and horizontal res, or what you should use instead of horizontal res is the pixels per scan line, if you're going to draw a pixel at a time, because that could be a different value than the horizontal resolution. It may be modulo the res, it may be a multiple, it may be something else. It may have extra data for, uh, for vertical blanks on the ends and things. I don't know. But I'm assuming that's the, the source of truth we, we should use for the horizontal resolution, so that's what I'm going to do there. I'll call it xres. That'll be from the GOP mode. It'll be info, but info is a pointer within there, so we'll dereference that. It should be info. I think it's called, yeah, with a capital I. Okay. And then I'll grab the pixels per scan line for from that. And for the Y resolution, I'll grab the vertical resolution, because that doesn't have a sort of different value that it could be there. So I'll say grab... Frame buffer, GOP info, even though it's self-explanatory, and we'll just say we'll clear the screen to a color. Just to draw it in if it's if it's a different color from what the main UEFI application is, which right now I just made it all blue, then we'll be able to tell that we loaded and ran this. So I'll just do that here. So let's say I or usually draw graphic draw graphics top left to bottom right where 0, 0 is the origin point in the top left for 2D, this 2D frame buffer. So Y would increase from 0 to the limit, which is the vertical res. X would increase from 0 to the limit, which is pixels per scan line. So I'm going to draw top to bottom, left to right. And the comparison is going to be Y less than Y resolution. So for each line on the screen, I want to draw something. We can do that with a double for loop here. We'll say X is going to be less than the X resolution. And I can offset from the frame buffer a 4-byte pixel value. And you would you would want to grab the pixel format and query or interrogate that, look at what that is. I'm going to assume we're working with just ARGB values. How UEFI lays it out will be a BGRA in memory, least significant to most significant. And they're all going to be 8 bits or 32-bit, 4-byte. So to grab a single pixel in there, to sort of translate 2D into 1D, to offset just one value from the frame buffer, we can say our current Y value multiplied by the width of a row to get the current row we're on, which will be X res. And we can offset within that row from 0 to the X limit by adding the X value here. So Y will start at 0, it'll be the first row, 0 offset by X will be some value in the first row. When we reach the end of that row, from 0 based indexing, Y will be 1. So one times the resolution will be onto the second row and we'll offset within that row, so on and so forth. And that can equal whatever color we want. So if I want like a dark gray, it would be maybe all threes, although the alpha could be Fs. So we're saying it's BGRA, but in memory low to high, it would be right to left. So this would be ARGB, 8888, pretty much is what this value will be. So blue would be in the bottom 8 bits, and then green, and then red. This would be a sort of dark gray color. So let's say dark gray. Or we can make it a light gray, all, all Ds, for example. And that should color everything on the screen. If you want to, like, do something a little different, fancier in there, we can just draw on like the top left, for example, start at zero, zero, and we'll just go like one fifth of the screen. So one twenty fifth of the screen in the top left will be like a square, and I can draw a different color in there. Let's say, I don't know, I'm trying to remember <laughs> the X colors. We can draw like a red, which would be all Fs would be red. Let's say a little bit darker red, and then these can be, I don't know, some low value. So it might not be exactly red, it'll look a little a little weird. I don't really know what that color will be. We'll find out. But the alphas, the alphas can probably be zero. I'm not dealing with transparency or anything. But that's all right. So for basic kernel, quote unquote, all it's going to do is draw to the screen. So how do I load that instead of loading a 
text file. Let's do that. So I have the load kernel function here. I'm not going to be messing with the test.txt sort of file anymore, so I can get rid of those strings. I'm not going to use them. And instead, I'll be searching for... Let me see where I'm using these right now. <laughs> instead of searching for data file, which is going to be test.txt, that string, I'm just going to search for a kernel file. And it could be called kernel.bin.elf.pe, whatever whatever extension. I'll just search for the, the prefix in there and see if we get that. Of course, if we have multiple files, then I'm sort of assuming only one of them is going to be named kernel. So this might have to change later, depending if multiple files have the same prefix. To keep it easy right now, I'll just do this. And I'll say we could not find kernel file if we couldn't find it. That'll be all right. If we could find it, I'll probably say, I'll just print something out here. We'll just say we found the kernel file. I'll print the file size and the disk LBA values. That's data file U16. I don't want to print the disk contents anymore. So if we found the disk LBA, I'll print that stuff out as well. So let's say file size, percent, I'll just print an, an unsigned int for these. Disk LBA, percent U. And that'll be file size and disk LBA. And then I'll print whatever format it is and we'll load and run it. So I'll print that out here. I suppose depending on the header bytes within the file. So let's say we have file format, it'll be something here. I don't know what it is at the moment. So I'll say load and run, or I'll just say load, load kernel file, depending on format, which will be in the header bytes. And for a flat binary, it won't have any pattern to it, so that's okay. For an L for PE file, it will. The first four bytes of an L file will be 7FELF, and the first two bytes of a portable executable file will be M and Z. But right now, we're not going to have either. It's a flat binary, and that's okay. But I could add stuff for this, just to check on that. And I know I loaded the file here to the disk buffer, because I made that good sort of abstracted function on the last video. So I know I'll have the kernel here, because I'm searching for anything that starts with kernel. I'm grabbing the disk LBA from there, as well as the size of it. And it's loading that up from this function. So I know I'll have it within this buffer. For a flat binary, I'm assuming the entry point is going to be at the start of that buffer. That might change later, and I'll have to change the code to find or set the entry point, like, in, like with a linker script right now. It should just be at the start of that buffer for the kernel file we're going to make. So I'm assuming it's just at the start of the buffer I want to execute it, pretty much. So I'm going to grab this type def, so I'll probably put it in a different file so I don't have to define it multiple times. But I'll grab the type def here. And I can grab data I want to send to the kernel, like for an entry point. So I'll do that. So kernel parms, let's say kparms, that's fine. That'll be the name of an, an instance of that. And I'll make an entry point here, which will be void. EFI API, it'll be a function pointer, I'll say it's entry point, and as a parameter to that, we'll take in the kernel parms struct, an instance of that, and right now that's not set to anything, so I'll do that. So let's do setup parameters to send to kernel. So eventually I have a memory map, this is a to-do get memory map and fill this out. But right now we're only sending that. Okay, so let's get the GOP info. Which I know I've gotten before. I might have just called it GOP. Probably not. Um, I had it at the bottom, right? That's the other, the other menu function. It's going to be set graphics mode. So I know I got it within here. Yeah, I did just locate protocol, so let's just grab this stuff. And I'll get rid of the stuff I don't need. 
So I don't need mode info, I don't need mode info size, or these things. I'm not saving modes for a menu. So yeah, I can just use locate protocol here. And that should also open the protocol. Put it within this GOP pointer. So I can fill that out. The GOP mode will be the GOP offset to the mode. That's going to be a pointer. So I can just grab the data at that pointer, dereference it, and fill that in the mode here to send that on to the entry point. So that'll be all right. So I want to load the kernel file depending on the format. And I can check the header bytes. Let's say we have a pointer. I'll just call it header. And that'll be set to the disk buffer, which is a void pointer. So that'll be implicitly cast. So I can just min compare and probably a little over engineered. We could just check header offset zero and one, but I like being fancy and doing some cursed C stuff sometimes. So if I compare the header against whatever bytes are starting off in the disk buffer, we can try to check what format it is. And we can do sort of compound literals and <laughs> we can do them anonymously in here. So this is kind of cursed, but I think it'll, it might work. If I set an array of four bytes here and syntax highlighting will say it's wrong, but that's fine. It'll still work. But we know an elf file starts with 7f elf, which I'll get into in a little bit. But let's just say that's going to count for an elf file. If we have that, then I'll say we have an elf file. So I'll say, I'm going to assume it's an elf 64. We'll have to dissect the other parts of the header, but I'm going to assume it's an elf 64 position independent executable. In that case, and I'll say it's not implemented yet. Okay. Else we can check the other stuff. Yeah, I'll just have a to-do for that. Else we can see if we don't have the two bytes for M and Z in the header. This is, this is a bad way of doing it, but I thought this was fun. I like doing, you know, different things that I find out how to do because they look interesting. So if I just have an, an anonymous sort of um, struct on the stack for an array of two bytes for M and Z, we can check if it's a portable executable file. So I'll say it's PE32+, plus, which is the 64-bit format for portable executables, position independent. And I don't have that implemented yet either. I'm going to assume if it's not one of those two, I'm not dealing with Mako or a.out or anything. I'm going to say it's just not going to be supported. And we'll just assume it's a flat binary. So I'm going to say no header bytes. We'll say assuming flat binary file. Yeah. Maybe it's, assuming it's a flat binary file, that's, yeah, that'll be all right. Okay, and in that case, we can set the entry point here, although we'll probably get a warning from uh, from the C compiler saying we can't set a function pointer to a void pointer. I'll get around that in a second, but I'm going to set the entry point just to the data buffer, or whatever I called it. I think I called it data, no, disk, disk buffer. So this is the buffer the file is loaded at. The kernel file is going to be loaded into there. We can just set the entry point to that point because I'm assuming the text section and the executable code is going to start at the start of that buffer. And disk buffer, not data buffer. And that will be okay. Then we can call it after this point. I'll get a key just to make sure info is all right. Instead of, I'll just copy this. Instead of any key to go back, I'll say press any key to load kernel. And then we'll get on our way by calling the entry point with the kernel args or kernel parms, I guess I called it. Yeah, k parms. So I'll just pass that in and we can execute the entry point. It's a function pointer that'll call it. Code beyond this point should not process. We should not return. Unless you want to in your code, but I'll say maybe I can tell the compiler a hint that we should never get here with an unreachable check there which means we won't have to worry about cleanup and everything, but I'll leave that there regardless. We should not return to this point. So, okay, let me print the header bytes actually. 
just to check what we have as well. So I'll just print out, I guess just the first four bytes, that'll be all right. I'll print them out as hexadecimal, I suppose. This is a probably not the best way of doing that, but that's all right. Let's say header bytes, we'll have this. And instead of no header bytes found, I'll say no format found. Okay. So this way we'll do the header 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Or well, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0 based indexing. Okay, I'll see what this looks like. Probably not great, but that's all right. So what did I mess up when compiling? Too few arguments because, oh, I need the length for memcompare, yeah. So this will be four bytes. We can just put a four after that. This will be two bytes. Okay, so ISO C forbids assignment between function pointer and void. That's a warning. The errors. GOP mode is not a pointer. Yes, in the kernel arc struct, it is a struct, not a pointer to a struct. That's true. So where is that at? Oh, that's in the kernel file. Okay. That is true. So these will be assumed to be fields in a struct, because that's what this is. It will not be a pointer to a struct. Okay. And again, that's not correct. So what does it not like? Oh, info is a pointer though. Okay. So info is a pointer within the struct, so that does have to be dereferenced to get its values. Yeah, that makes sense. I forgot about that. Okay, but the other thing was a warning. I'll get rid of the warning in a second. I just want to see what this shows so far. Okay, so we did find the kernel file. We found that prefixed kernel within the data files inf file. It'll just say kernel.bin in, in here. It did make the flat binary kernel that compiled. It says we have these random bytes, no format found, assuming it's a flat binary. And we loaded the kernel. Hey, it still has the text on there, which isn't great. <laughs> and it still has the timer on there. So I'll get rid of the timer. I forgot about that. But it does load. It does print. It does do that stuff. So that's cool. It should not return, but it did return. Oh, because this goes back. Yeah, let me put in like an infinite loop here. All right, that way this will just be... That way it won't return. Do not return. We'll say back to UEFI. So it's, it's not really a kernel. I mean, we haven't exited boot services. We haven't gotten a memory map. However, we can load and run a program. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Okay, so it does print the time, but it does print stuff out. So that is a red. I just didn't want it to be a blinding red. Okay, so let's get rid of that timer. Let me do that. So the timer I set up in the main code down here, and when I'm exiting, I should be ending it. Yeah, so I just need to call close event timer, but that means I need access to that timer event outside of main. So instead of putting it here in main, I'm just gonna put it like with these global variables at the top, probably. Yeah, I'll just put it over here. This will be global, global timer event. That way in the bottom, well, not in the bottom, but in the code down here, instead of closing it on escape, we'll also close it before leaving. So let me do that. Close timer event so that it does not continue to fire off. Because when you exit boot services, I don't think that'll be available. It might cause errors or page faults or things later, so I probably do want to not have that active... <laughs> at the point where I call, call the kernel. Okay. So I'm gonna get rid of this warning in a second. I just wanna check that this works. And it does, and we don't see that timer show up anymore. So that's good, okay. So ISO C does not like function pointer and void pointer, even though uh, DLSIM or some other functions like in POSIX convert implicitly or explicitly between those two. We can kind of, quote unquote, <laughs> get around that. It's not a great way of doing things, but I can get around that here. And I'll have to do it elsewhere as well. 
but this is, I, I don't recommend doing this, but this will work, <laughs> at least to get rid of the error, and that's, or get rid of the warning. And that's if you take the, the address here, since this is a void function pointer technically, it's a void pointer here. If I take the address of that, that'll be a void double star, double pointer. If I dereference that, we'll have a void pointer, and a void pointer is what disk buffer is defined as. So if I take the address of a void pointer and then set the data at that, double void pointer, we're setting two void pointers equal, and the compiler's okay, and it'll say that is not a warning. That's not really a great way of doing it, though. That probably could cause some errors and is probably undefined behavior somehow, but... Oh well, I like doing cursed stuff that gets around it, because it's kind of fun. So, get around compiler warning about function versus data pointer, I guess. Function versus void pointer, so, okay. So that way we don't have that pointer show up down there in the make output, and this will work. It'll still load. We load the stuff, okay. Just want to make sure that works for the most part. And that is how we load basically a file. <laughs> I'm not getting the memory map, the memory map or exiting boot services, and that's okay. I do want to load an L4 PE file as well, however, so let's go ahead and make those just as examples here. So let's say instead of a, a bin file here, we'll make an elf, and then I'll make a PE file loader as well. Oh, MinGW, yeah, I guess I could do that first. So GCC is not going to like me just doing this stuff, but I'll try it here to begin with so we can see the output that happens. And I need to make this. I'll just comment this out because it has the same the same target here. So instead of Clang, let's use the GCC compiler here. And that didn't, just copying the word is not going to work because we have dashes. All right, let's put that there. So I can do fpy kernel.o, this will make a PE object, which should be dynamic, and there is a specific LD as well that comes with mingw, so I can use that just to be consistent here, but it's not really going to like it. There we go, make sure it's a tab. It doesn't allow format binary, I don't think. So I try to run that. It's not doing the kernel stuff. Let's get rid of this for that as well. Make clean so it remakes it. Yeah, okay. So when it tries to make the kernel file, we'll say, cannot perform PE operations on non-PE output file, which is lame. I don't know why that's not allowed, but it is for an elf file. I guess it just, I don't know, it just doesn't work as well, in my opinion. But that's okay. We can link in two steps instead of doing that. So instead of making a, a binary output, we'll just do whatever the normal output is. And I'll call it something else. So instead of kernel.bin, I'll call it kernel.obj. For example, it's going to be an it's going to be an executable. It's going to be a PE executable. But we're going to say it's an object for another step after. And if you have object copy, we can set the output format to binary for that. And then I don't remember what the uh, parameters are for that, which is just dash o and it's in file and then out file, because it's got to be different. So the input file here would be kernel.obj. The output file would be the final output target, which is going to be kernel.bin, and then I'll copy that over. So this should make a flat binary from a portable executab executable object, whereas Clang up here made the output binary from an ELF object, because this is a specific cross-compiler to make portable executable files. So, okay. That's a mouthful, but that go ahead, goes ahead and makes the kernel and copies it, it copies it in. This should still hopefully work. It has maybe different bytes than before. The file size is probably different, but it is a flat binary. It does work. It does make the file. So that's how you get around that little issue there. Just a couple more steps, but that's all right. So let me make an elf target here. I'm just going to copy this back because I like it having one less step, but okay. So this being kernel.elf, that would be ran if this is 
if this kernel is uncommented for kernel.elf. And what I can do for that is basically the same thing, but not make a separate object. <laughs> I can make a position independent and executable. I can set the entry point to kmain, and, and we can just make the, the object itself. I don't have to do a separate linking step, I don't think. Well, we can send it no standard live as well. Let me do that. A separate linking step. And we don't have to set a binary. We can make it into the elf itself. And then dash O, let's say that's going to be kernel.elf. And then we'll copy that into there. Okay. And then we'll add that in from here under all. I think that's all I have to do for that. Let's find out. So that should have made kernel.elf. It should add it in there. We'll add that to the path to the data partition. Okay. So I don't have anything for the elf file. It actually says it's a position independent executable, which is not great. <laughs> so I did I did my comparison wrong there, but that is uh, that's all right. I think I did that right. So elf should be here. I can just check with read elf right quick. That is an elf file. Okay. And if you notice, it is a position independent executable, which is what I wanted. We can also look at the object file from that, which is not going to be there because that's from the flat binary object, which is probably the flat binary is probably cough. Yeah. The kernel dot bin would be a flat binary. It wouldn't have anything. I just want to make sure. Yeah, that would say data. Okay. So let me go where I'm loading. Yeah, I'm loading the kernel. So this comparison didn't work, which is fine. That's that's normal. <laughs> I figured that wouldn't. I wanted to make sure it was. It did work, but it did not. That's okay. For some reason, it said this though, which is interesting. That says it adds the elf file, but this says that is elf sixty four pi. Huh. Oh, it is. It is an elf. Okay. Sorry, I can't read. That does say it's an elf sixty four file. So we are comparing that correctly. Okay. I just don't have anything to do that with and that's all right i'll probably just go on or return here or something actually i'll just go to cleanup in this case if it's not implemented okay i just want to make sure that code works first if i go into there i press a key it goes back all right And let me put an extra new line there so visually it's different. Okay, so it'll say press any key to go back. All right, so let me also make, before I write loaders for those, I just want to make sure that the comparisons work for checking the file formats. So let me make a position independent file here, which I can do whatever I'm currently doing for Clang or for GCC. I'll probably use the GCC one because it tends to work a little bit better sometimes for other linking errors. But I can probably do similar things, actually. We'll just do that. So position independent executable, give it no standard live, give it the, the main stuff there, give it the regular C flags so that it's freestanding and all. And I'll output kernel.pe from the source and we'll copy that, okay. And then this will add it to the output file. All right. So that should make the kernel here. Makes the kernel.pe. That's all there. All right. Oh, and just for any of these, if you want to see what they look like, again, we can go into this option and look at the data files if you're inside of the, the, virtu the virtual machine here. So that says it's kernel.pe, so that's good. But I exited out. <laughs> I want to load the kernel. We have 4D and 5A, which should be M and Z. Yep. And it finds PE32 plus PIE, not implemented yet. No implemented yet. That's English. Okay, and then that goes back. Uh, all right. That is what I wanted. So that's good. Okay. This says not implemented. It said no implemented. That's kind of funny. I guess it could have print, couldn't print all the text, but anyway. Uh, we'll go ahead and make loaders for these. I guess I'll make stubs right now, which isn't really going to do anything. 
let's just say we make a stub that's like load load elf and I'll pass in the buffer for where the elf file is which is disk buffer for PE we'll have a load PE function and okay let's assume that these functions are going to return an address for the entry point so like a void pointer or something which will probably be inside of a new buffer that normally we would have to free the memory for but if we're going to jump to it it's fine the memory's already set up and we're not going to return past this point anyway but let's just assume they're going to return an address for the entry point let's say it'll be a void pointer address here so we can do this sort of thing again which is not not great i just think it's kind of funny that you can do that and get around the warning it's probably not not intended but oh well yeah, the only function I know of that actually does a, a function to void pointer that I've seen online is the dlsim function. So I'm assuming, I mean, there's a reason that it works, and it's okay. I don't expect anything bad to come about that, but that's fine. So I guess we'll do this. Instead of going to cleanup, we'll go on. But we'll say it's not going to be implemented. That's fine. I'll probably put that within these functions. So above this file, let's say we have ones for those. I have a couple of stubs here. Instead of status, I'll return a void pointer. I guess the UE5 void is capital. Let's say load elf, and I'll pass in a void pointer as well, and it'll be, I guess, just buffer. I'll say file buffer, or elf buffer. We'll load it to another buffer, which will be the program buffer that the program sections are loaded into. Right now, we'll do this. So I'll say load an elf file into a new buffer and return entry point. I guess return the entry point for the loaded uh, elf program. Let's say elf64 PIE file, just to be specific. Okay, so this text that's not implemented, I'll put that in right here. Right now, we'll just do this. Okay. Okay, so it'll go there and there. All right, and I'll just copy that as a stub for a PE loader as well. That'll do in the future. So it'll be PE32. Move that so my head's not in the way. PE32 plus is the 64-bit version for portable executables. BPE buffer, and I'll copy this here. Okay. So that should be all I need to do for this stuff. All right. I'll separate that a little bit. Okay, so I'll start with an elf sort of loader here. Let me make sure this still works. Unused parameter. Yeah, that's all right. I just want to make sure it still works. It says PE32 plus not implemented, not implemented yet. But then it says go on to load the kernel. <laughs> Just probably not what I not what I want to do. But that's all right. Okay, so I'll work on the elf the elf loader first here. Um, I'm gonna take a break and get more water, and do other stuff first. But I'll be back when I'm ready to do this. I just have to refresh on the format and then look it up again, like on Wikipedia or whatever. But um, yeah. So I'm going to do that next. I'm going to write an elf loader, and then if that goes well, I'll write a PE loader. Just for a really basic, I'm not going to look at the symbol tables. I'm just going to copy the loadable program sections into memory. And if it's a position-independent executable, those are all offsets from the start of a buffer. That buffer being the disk buffer, the elf buffer pointer that's passed in. We can grab the elf header and program header sections from that. And then take the loadable sections, uh, take whatever relative offset they're at, and make sure that's copied over into the new section according to the program section info and other things. And we'll get that going. So I'll do that next. All right, let's continue with this program loading. I'm going to do elf first. So I added some type defs and things for that. And I just marked the new lines that I added here. So just to remember what I did. Uh, this doesn't change anything really, but in the make file, there is actually a linker flag for position independent executables. You can add dash pi. It doesn't seem to really affect things here for the flat binary, but I figure it's not going to hurt if I add that in. So I just added pi for the linker lines here. 
It doesn't change anything, but I figure, yeah, I might as well add that in there. But in EFI.C, I just went and looked up the ELF sort of the ELF format there. I looked up the, the Wikipedia page, executable and linkable format, and it has a couple of tables here. So instead of looking at, you could also look at the spec, right? The System 5 ABI and other specifications, but we have the tables already here that are laid out nicely. So I just, you know, copy this stuff. So that's what I did here, pretty much. So I have the identifier, which is going to be 16 bytes. I just broke it out. Then the other the other fields there for the 64-bit ELF header. So just all on one page there. And then the program header. I'm not going to worry about the section header, since I just need to load the loadable program headers from the ELF file. That's really all I need to worry about at the moment. Not doing anything too fancy with them. But these are basically just the structs from those things. So the ELF header itself, the overall header, gives you the type. Uh, the machine it's supposed to run on gives you the entry point address. So that is where we can set the entry point to, and we can execute that point. Gives you the offset within this ELF file of where the program headers are. Gives you the number of program headers, as well as the size of each entry, the size of the section headers as well, and the string index. We have flags we can check. We have a, uh, I guess that's the, the size of the ELF header itself is an EH size. So it gives you everything you need to go to the other sections. And then the program header section gives you all the program headers with the type, which we're only interested in the loadable type. So the ones that are needed to load and run the program. But there's also flags and the offset within the ELF file, the virtual address, the physical address, which should match the virtual or it might be zero. And if it is zero, then you would pad out the difference with zeros. <laughs> It'll be initialized memory, the difference in these two. We have the actual physical size of the data within this specific program header section. We have the size in memory. Um, I guess that would be the difference, actually. <laughs> the file size and the memory size. The difference in those would be zero padded. The physical and virtual address is just where it's going to be at starting in memory. And then an alignment value if it needs to be aligned on a specific boundary, like a page size, 4K or 8K or what have you. Uh, the ELF header types, the E-type field, I'm only really going to be worried about dynamic. I added ex executable just as a comparison, but dynamic is three. And then for the program header section, that P type, I'm only worried about the loadable types. So I just added in those structs that we'll be using there. And you can also see those if you do something like read elf and look at the header for probably for the elf type kernel. DYN, the position independent executable, that is type three and that E type field should be able to look at the program sections as well. But I don't remember what those look like. Program headers is L or segments. So if I look at L, I would look at P header interpreter. Well, really just these, the ones that are loadable would be the ones that I'm gonna be loading. So that should correspond to basically text, maybe data or RO data or stuff like that but we'll have an alignment value. It'll be readable, executable, readable, writable. That's probably data. Executable is probably text, the text section. So stuff like that. We'll be loading in the sections that we need. It says the offset, the file size, and the memory size. So the difference in these two would be padded with zeros for sort of a BSS section, if you will, or just initialized data, uninitialized data. Physical address is where it would appear, which should probably match the virtual. Uh, but that's all right. Oh, it's okay. This is the offset. This is virtual. This is physical. It'd help if I actually read the, the screen, wouldn't it? This is the file size. This is the memory size. So are any of these different? I don't think they are because I have a very small file that's just drawing to the frame buffer. But anyway, that's an example of stuff. And that's what we're going to be loading. So the only other place where I put new is just after I get the entry point, since it returns a void pointer or these functions load PE and load elf return null. Since I haven't done anything with them yet, I figure if it's null, then the entry point is null. And if that doesn't exist, we'll go to cleanup. So it doesn't try to doesn't try to load anything that you know isn't available yet. That's all. That's all I did there. Conflicting types have enum anonymous. And function load elf. Uh okay. I didn't do anything, but alright. That's interesting. 
These are packed, but that should be... Oh, because I called it elf header type. <laughs> Program header type. I guess, or prog header or something. I'll do E header. E header and P header. Yeah, need to give a difference there. And those parameters are unused. So I just want to see that if we have... Okay, flat binary is going to load. But if I change the make file to make an elf, I just want to make sure it doesn't load so that I did that stuff all right. And it says not implemented and it goes back. Yeah, not implemented and we go back. Okay. That's all I wanted to do there. All right, so in load elf, we have the buffer that's passed in. That's gonna be where the elf file is so I can grab this data and get a pointer to it from that buffer there. So I'll just grab that. And let's say that'll be elf header 64, not EFL. I'll just call it eHeader, I guess. We can have a pointer. That'll equal an eHeader pointer. And that'll be pointer to the buffer, yeah, which I don't need to cast that because a void pointer will be casted. I have to remind myself of that. So we can look at and interrogate those values if we want. We can print them to screen. Or we can just, you know, go on and load the thing. I guess if you want to know before we load everything, I could print out data. I've done that before. So we'll just say we'll print uh, elf header info and then program header info. Uh, yeah, I'll just do that. So let's say, well, the type will be 64-bit or it should be 64-bit. I suppose we could interrogate these things. Machine version, entry. I'll probably care about the entry point and the program header offset and such, but yeah. We'll just, we'll print these out. Type machine version should always be one. We'll print the entry. Entry is hexadecimal. We'll do program header offset. Or headers, it'll be headers. Offset. We can do U or X for these. That'll probably be enough for 25 characters. Let me go down. Section headers would be good, but I'm not worried about those right now. We have flags, which will be used for something. <laughs> the size of the overall elf header. Might want to put that first. Eh, it doesn't matter. I'll just put them in the order that they appear in, I guess. Let's do this. I'll do, just to save some room, program headers, offset, program entry size, so I can verify with the, the spec in Wikipedia that these are probably correct. I'll do number of program headers. And then that's really all we need from there. So that would be elf header 64, so that'd be e header, and we dereference to get these things. So we'd have type, machine, yada yada yada. E machine, that was made by like Asus or Acer, wasn't it? Didn't we used to have e machines? I know we had like the netbooks. Don't remember, that was a while back. Program header offset, BPH offset, elf header size, doesn't really matter. Program entry size would be E, PH, int size. I'll put these on each line that they were on. That'd be EPH num. Okay. Yeah, I'll just get it. Well, we'll get a key when we go back anyway. All right, unused PE buffer. That's all right. So we have an elf here. Pi not implemented yet. All right, so type is three. Okay, machine is three E. Entry is a thousand. So the entry point is just at 4K. Program header offset is at. Byte position 64 in the file, the elf header size. 
for a 64-bit ELF header is probably 64, so that's correct. Program entry size is 56, and there's 10 program headers. Not all of them are loadable, but that's all right. So is type supposed to be 3? Three? 3 is dynamic, so that is good. Okay, just to verify that. I don't care about the other stuff, really. Machine was 3E, though, which should be AMD x86-64, so that's good. If it doesn't have an entry point at 0. Usually 40 for 64-bit elf executable, yep, which is 64. We could have flags for the architecture. I don't care too much. This is usually 38 or 64 bits for the entry size, so that was right. Okay, so the values seem all right. So we can go on from there. Yeah, the values seem all right. We can go on from there. Okay, so let's go. I'll just print, uh, we'll print the loadable program header info for user. We will implement it. So the program headers are going to be elf program header as the type, 64 that is. And I actually could check here, depending on the e header type, I'll say if, if e header e type is not equal et dynamic, then it's not, um, it's not a pi, it's not a position independent executable. So I'll say only allow, yeah, PIE files. So it needs to be dynamic. If it's not dynamic, then we'll return null here. I'll probably print in, yeah, I'll print in an error to the user. So I'll say elf e type is not et dynamic zero three. Yeah, elf is not a PIE file. E type is not this. I'll I'll say that. And they can look up what that is on their own, assuming the user knows what that is, but it's better than nothing. Better than nothing for an error message, but okay, the program headers, well, let's say P header instead of E header. And I'll grab a pointer to that array. And that will be probably a P header pointer to some position in here. So we have the elf buffer, we have the elf header, and we have the offset where that is. So I can do this. I can cast the input buffer where everything is loaded to just to get a, a one byte pointer arithmetic here so that sizes line up better. Then I can add an offset from that wherever the offset is in the header. Or I could cast the header to that. That might be better actually, yeah. Let's cast the header to a, a one byte pointer here and we'll offset from that to wherever the ph off is, the program header offset. Since that starts at the start of the buffer, that'll be okay. And that should give us a pointer to the offset where the program headers start. Okay, then I can have, we'll just have i equal to zero or however big ph num is, which ph num is a 16 bit pointer. So for all the program headers, I'll go through and just print the loadable ones. So we can say if p header offset uh, the type, p underscore type, if that's not equal to pt load, it's not loadable. So that's down here. Get both of those on the screen. So if we don't have a loadable type, I don't really care. We'll continue. So I'll say only interested in loadable program headers. But if it is a loadable type, we'll just print out some info about it. So I know what type it is. Flags, I guess I don't really care. We can say offset. Let me print this to begin with. Let's say loadable, loadable program headers. And we'll say this will be offset. We'll have virtual address and physical address. I'll print all these in hex, I guess. We'll have file size, which will just be the physical size of it. Well, physical and virtual and memory. Yeah, so I guess I'll do that. I'll do file size. I'll put this on the next line, maybe. This be 5, 10, 15. Yeah, we'll see how it looks. I'll print the number maybe as well. I'll have an incrementing number 
Well, we already have I for that. Okay. So I'll print I first as the number. We'll print these three and then the next few. File size, we'll do memory size. And the alignment. I'll just print them all in hex, I suppose. That'll be all right. We'll see how that looks. I might add another line in between, but we'll see how that looks. So I have I. I is a 16-bit, so let's just make that wider. Then all of these are just going to be uh, dereferences from the pointer again here. This will be P offset. So VP virtual address and physical address. P file size or file SZ. P mem SZ and alignment. P align, okay. So that'll be all the program headers, then we'll go from there. I just want to see how these look like. Expected expression before that. P header pointer, right? Is that not? It's not correct because it's not going to be P header. It's going to be elf program header. There we go. I need the actual types to line up correctly. PH num is undeclared. So it needs to be E header. PH num. Okay. Uh, so I don't have any loadable program headers. I kind of doubt that that is the case because I need the offset from it. Duh. Sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. I won't do I++. Well, I can do I++. I'll need to increment this P header. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> so the size of a program header is going to be, you know, the size of the data at this pointer. So we can just increment that to increase by the size of a program header each time. And that will point to the next one in the array up until the final one. Because we have the entry size, they'll all be the same size sort of packed together. So that should actually offset and give the right headers. There we go. Okay, so header two, is that offset zero? Virtual and physical address are zero. File size is 2e9, memory size is 2e9. Alignment is 1,000. So 4K alignment, or page size alignment for most of those. Okay, that's not too bad. Let's put a line before this as well. All right, so to actually load these things, we'll need a few other bits of logic here. We'll have to allocate memory first, so I guess I can do that in here as well. So print loadable program header info for the user and get metrics or measurements for loading. Uh, yeah, I guess that's fine. Let's have a maximum alignment value. Let's have a start and end of total memory that all these program sections will take up. If that makes sense. So we have a physical and virtual address here, and we have an alignment value. So I can get the maximum amount of alignment and try to align everything up until that max, so everything's aligned neatly, and I can get the total amount of memory that all of the program headers that are loadable take up, according to the physical and virtual address, pretty much. So I did this on my OS, which is why I had, <laughs> I had the tab open, because I probably was going to forget how I did this. So the virtual address plus the memory size plus an alignment. And if the alignment was less, so I set it to a page size by default. Okay. I don't consider it cheating if I already did it before, right? <laughs> I just forgot how it worked. Uh, oh well. I'll just do this because I'm going to forget. Okay. Yeah, so I call this max alignment. All right. So P header, oh, I offset by I. I mean, that would be good too. But I could just use it as a pointer. So 
If the alignment value is greater than my maximum alignment, which I started at the page size, and my page size was 1K, I can probably add that at the top. Let me do that as a, uh, a constant here. So 4096, we'll just have it be 4K. Because most of the alignment values are going to be at that 4K boundary. So if we have something that's greater than that, then any section above that, or well, any section after this point really, will have that as the new maximum alignment value. So if we have a section, if we have a program header that needs an 8K alignment, I'll probably just align all the headers at 8K boundaries. So that's what this is kind of updating, the maximum alignment we need for any and all program headers. Then I'm going to use a, a start and ending value for uh, for memory here. So these are just temporaries for this program header. So the virtual address is where the program header will start at in memory. The virtual address plus the size and memory it takes up will be how big it is. And then to get to the next alignment value after that point, to make sure the next program header after it is aligned correctly, I add the alignment on top of that. So minus one gets us 4,095 in this case, but that's right below the page size, which would be, that's right below the alignment value, which would be at alignment, but right before that, and you know, zero based indexing and memory, yeah, memory indexing and all that, we can, we can just subtract one from here to get up until that point at which the next alignment would take place. So the virtual address that it starts at, plus the amount of memory it takes up, plus padding to align the next header or whatever after this point. That's going to be the maximum amount, the ceiling of memory that it would take up, or the ending point. So then I'm just aligning it with the alignment value. We do not 1,000, well, not 4,095, which would be what this is. Starting off, it might be 8K, but if it doesn't change from 4K, then it'd be this value. Uh, what would it be? We'd have Fs, right? If it was a 32-bit and then not minus one uh, would be what? Seven in all Fs or eight? I don't remember these things. <laughs> we'll have the output be in, uh, in, uh, in hexadecimal. So 16 will be the output format. And the input, we'll just say 4096, right? You know, so we have a thousand in hex. So 4095 will be three Fs. Okay, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> What this does is get, get the next align value for these two. It just makes sure they're sort of 4K aligned to start off with, if not 8K or whatever the maximum value is going to be here. I can't explain things very well. <laughs> so why am I anding with that? I don't remember, but that gets the next align value pretty much. So if my start or beginning uh, yeah, so if the start of memory for this is before the start of memory that I'm using here, which what I want to do is set this to some high value. Like UN64 max is going to be the largest that I can do, and can be zero. So this way, if we start at the high value, or let's say, for theoretical example, infinity, anything below this will lower this value. So if we start memory below that value, which is what I want to do here, instead of min, we'll do start. Or ceiling floor may make more sense, but we'll set start equal to that. And coincidentally, or yeah, also if the end of memory for this section is greater than our current end of memory, I want to increase the range that all the program headers take up. That's the whole point of this. So if that's greater than the end of my current memory, um, start and end is what I called this, right? Hmm. Let's do, maybe it'll make more sense if I do ceiling and floor. I don't, I don't know. I don't have good values for this or min and max, which is probably what I had before. Okay. 
Yeah, if it's less than a minimum, we'll set the new minimum. If it's greater than the maximum, we'll set the new maximum. That makes more sense, probably. Okay, so then we have the total size we need for the file. I'm not going to call it buffer size. Well, it'll be the size for a buffer. I'll say max memory needed. So memory needed for file will be that value. Okay. So then we can allocate a buffer for that amount of memory to load those program headers into, and that will also take into account the maximum alignment value. We'll also use that. This needs to be max alignment. That's what I called that variable. Okay. So we'll allocate a buffer for those. And I don't have status here. I can do that here. We can allocate pool or pages. I'll do pool because that's what I have been doing. Um, actually, let me go back and grab the error there. So EFI loader data, that's fine. The buffer size is going to be this memory that we need to load. And then we need a buffer to put that into. So I'll say this is going to be our, our program buffer as opposed to just the elf buffer, the input to this. So I don't need that as the issue. Okay, so just if it's an error, we'll say, yeah, could not allocate memory for elf, for elf program. And we'll just, uh, yeah, we'll return null in that case. Otherwise, we did allocate memory for that. So we'll load the program headers into buffer. And we'll return the entry point after that. So we could have done this probably within, well, no, we have to get the maximum values. I was going to say we could have done this at the same time, but that's all right. So for all the loadable program headers, I'll go back through them. Of course, we already incremented the program header past that point, so I got to reset that. Okay. So I can do a, a mem copy, which I already have in this, yeah, in this file. That'll be all right. So let's say we get a, a destination, which will be something and we'll have a source, which will be something, and we'll have a length, which will be something for each program header. And then I'll mem copy, you know, those things there. We want to have and keep the same relative offset for each program header, for each loadable section of the program that was in the executable originally. So if something was like a thousand bytes into the elf file, a thousand bytes into the buffer, I want to keep that same boundary. So I got to keep those things consistent here when I copy into the new, uh, the new buffer. Okay, so let me see how I did that originally. Let me cheat, because <laughs> I forgot the mem set as well. Oh, I'm just going to copy this stuff and the entry point. So not, not great, but that's okay. All right, do I have a mem set in here as well? I do. I'm glad I remember that. All right, because I would have forgotten that as well. So I called it program buffer, right? Yeah. So if I set all of the memory for all the program headers to zero, that ensures that the difference within the file size and the memory size for each program header, right, the file size and the memory size, the difference needs to be padded with zeros or initialized to zeros from just the, the ELF file format specification itself, and that ensures that we can have uh, stuff like a proper BSS section and data sections and data is initialized correctly to zeros where it needs to be. It keeps the program header smaller in the executable, but when loaded and ran in memory, it can be larger, right? Because that specifies the difference that can be set up by the loader. So that's what we're doing here. And that ensures I don't have to do that later. I can just do it once here. 
Okay, so for each of these, let me grab an offset. And I called it relative offset. I can really just, yeah, copy this. So with PIE, with, um, yeah, with position independent executables, we have an offset that the section is within the file since they use relative offsets for position independence. In a portable executable file, it would be the RVA, it'd be the same thing. So we can just have that here. I'm just gonna make the types a little different. So the virtual address minus the sort of the absolute start of memory that we calculated will be the relative offset for that program header within the ELF program, both in the original executable and in this new buffer that we're putting it into. It'd be the same offset. It's just instead of the start of, we'll say, the ELF buffer, the original file that it was loaded in to keep that same offset, I want to offset it from the start of memory for this sort of new buffer that we're getting. We got the maximum memory low and high, the range that we needed for all the uh, for all of the uh, the program headers. So I want to offset from that new sort of floor um, to coincide with the offset from the original floor in the original file. I'm trying to say it repeatedly so it might make more sense because <laughs> I'm not saying it too well. But anyway, with that, I'll just copy these here. With that, we can do this stuff. This can be a void pointer, really. Well, it'll, it'll have to be a void pointer. Well, we can make it a uint date. That way it has byte pointer arithmetic. So the program buffer plus this offset is going to be the same offset in the original elf file that we want to put in the new one for the same program header. So I want to load into that same position in the, in the new buffer to load and run the program at. So that's why I'm setting that offset from the start of this new buffer. So we have the total memory needed for all the program headers. We made a buffer. We made a buffer with all that memory. So I want to offset from the start of that buffer, the same offset from the start as the original file it's coming from for this specific header. That's what this is doing. That's the new destination address. So the new source address that the data is coming from would be the original file, which is going to be the elf buffer in this case. We'll have byte pointer arithmetic as well. Yeah, the elf buffer here. So the original file the program header is located in. And I'm going to take the physical offset of that within that buffer, which is from the program header's p offset field. That tells us the physical offset, not the relative offset. But we take where the actual data is in that original buffer and we put it at the new offset in the new buffer according to its relative memory position. And then the amount of data we want to put within that is the size of the program header, and that is corresponding to the memory size. Not the file size, but the memory size, which should always be at or equal uh, or larger than the, the file size in the program header. So the, the file size and the memory size can be equal usually. If the memory size is bigger, then the difference is going to be padded with zeros. So that's already taken care of by this mem set. And then we're just putting the physical memory in there. So if that's less than, well, that'll actually just be the greatest amount of data we can put in there for the, the file itself. If that's equal to the physical size, that's fine. If it's larger, it's fine, because the whole thing's been padded with zeros anyway. And then we just do a mem copy there, and that'd be all right. Okay, so it's really, it's not that complicated. It's just hard to try and explain <laughs> when you're not good at it, but that's okay. So let me do that. And we can say what we're mem copying there. That's all right. So dest will be, we'll just do that for the types. Okay. All right, so after that's loaded into the buffer, we can have an entry point that we return. And that is going to be, well, we already have the entry point from the original from the original elf buffer passed into this file, passed into this function rather, we have the e entry, so that is the address of the entry point, but that is also at a relative virtual address from the start of the original elf file. And since we're using 
a relative address for all the program headers. We also have to use a relative address for the entry point. So a way to do that is to grab the original, the same relative address, you know, as the original file as we are in this new one. So in this new buffer that we allocated, the, the entry point will be at the same position, right? In the same relative position. So we can just get the difference between the new memory floor, the range of all the program headers, the entry is going to be part of the program headers. It'll be within that range. So we can grab the offset from this new minimum amount of that range, and that'll be the same, should be corresponding to the same relative offset that it was in the original ELF executable. So I'm just using byte-wise, single byte, pointer arithmetic to grab that same offset and getting a void pointer to that. So it should be the same entry point in the new buffer as it was in the original ELF file. Okay. <laughs> and then I can return that entry point as the void pointer that's returned. Okay. And that should allow us to load and run an ELF file and not too much code. So we'll see how that ends up being. It might not work, probably won't, because I always have issues. Alignment is undeclared because I called it max alignment. Uh, here, yeah, the one spot I missed. Uh, let me do, do make out here so I get better syntax highlighting. Mine is undeclared at 2115. Yeah. That's what I get when I copy stuff over. Let me make sure I don't have any, yeah, offsets there. Okay. I see an argument one from incompatible because it needs a U there. It's 2129. That's well there. Just make sure those are 16 bit. And buffer size 2141. So I do get more, you know, I get more issues when I copy code, but I was not going to be able to <laughs> explain that and come up with it off the top of my head, obviously. Buffer size here is going to be however big the buffer is, which is max memory needed. That is the buffer size in that case. Okay, cast from pointer, a different size. Let me make sure that those are fixed. 2161. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go... Well, at this point, it's over here. Okay, you went 32 dest, because that is a pointer. I just want to cast it to a value. Well, it gives a warning, but... Cast from pointer to int of different size. Is that not okay? I guess it doesn't like that. Oh, I don't have to say what the mem copies are. Just for edification. We'll know what they are. Okay. So for the program headers, we get this. So two, three, four, five within the array. That's the same value as it was before. We'll get a max alignment value, which should be 4K because they're all the alignment's 4K for all these. We should load those all into the new buffer. Yeah, the entry point is 1,000 there at like the fourth line down on the screen next to the machine entry. So the entry point's at 4K, but the relative offset from the old position, whatever that is, will be the same relative offset in the new buffer should be. And if we load it, hey, it works. We loaded and ran an ELF file by loading the program headers, the loadable portions of the program headers, and it worked. Hey, that's cool. So I want to do the same thing for the PE files, which will be somewhat similar explanations. It'll be probably slightly shorter code, depending on the info I want to print out. I don't think we have to compute this because we'll already have the RVA values, but that's fine. So we'll actually use the PE buffer here, I'm putting this so the compiler warning goes away. Okay, but I'm gonna load and run PE, a PE file next. So let me make that first. It's already being made in the make file, right? Yep. So let's just make sure that's actually getting made. Okay, PIE, all right. So I'm gonna load and run that and I'm gonna do that next. So I'll see, you, I'll see you in a second, because <laughs> i got to uh, look up and copy the structs for that first. And I don't like recording, copying, and pasting structs, because it's boring. So I'm going to get the, uh, the required definitions for portable executable, and I'll be back in a second. All right, let's continue here with the UEFI dev. Going to do PE file loading. I had a couple of new things from the last part. Just I made the 
some memory alignment for loading the ELF files. I made some of those, changed them from uint32 to uint ends, is basically all those are. And I added structs for the PE types, but I'll go over that in a second. So just wanted to show that all I changed was, I think this was uint32, but I just made all the memory the memory variables, we'll say, uint ends, so that I can actually use and load files correctly. If some someday they're above four gigs, we want to be able to do that and have correct values here. So I just made everything uint in. Uh, but anyway, the main thing that I'm going over now is portable executable files, 64 bit, so PE32 plus. And I got the data for these tables from Microsoft's documentation on the PE format. We're, similarly to ELF, we're going to be allocating a buffer for the program and we're going to be loading sections of the original PE buffer into that new program buffer and then get an entry point from that and load the entry point. But the layout and structure is different, of course. So if I go to the file headers, this doesn't go over the, the DOS stub or the signature, really. Well, it says what the signature is, but it doesn't go over the original DOS stub. It just says that location... Uh, 60 in decimal or 3c in hex, right? 48 plus 12. There is a file offset to the PE signature. So the, fo the file format at whatever that offset is should be 4 bytes, PE00, to signify portable executable. And then right after that, that magic bytes, we're going to have the COF file header, which has info such as, oh, that was weird, <laughs> info such as the machine we're running on, like x86-64 or i386 or R or ARM or RISC-V or something. We have the number of sections, which will be however many sections we need to load to run the thing. You know, when it's made, the symbol table, I'm not going to worry about that. The optional header is the size of the next sort of required header. It can be a variable size, so it helps that they put the size of that here, because there can be a variable number of uh, whatever was in this image, data, data directories immediately following it. So if you want to know how big it is, because it's a variable size, we want to get the size from there. And then flags or characteristics for the overall PE image, they call it an image, but the file itself, such as if it's executable or not. So the flag I'm going to be checking and looking for basically is only if it's executable, and we can also check if the machine type is x86-64 here, because in hex it's 86-64. 32-bit would be 14C it looks like for i386 or later. And there's one for MIPS and RISC 5 and things. So the flags, the characteristics field is going to be, what I'm going to check for is, I think, just executable, which is just two, <laughs> if the flag is set for bit two, I guess, or if we AND with that field and this bit is set, then we know it's an executable image and we can run it as an executable. The other ones I don't really care about, but you can check if it's been stripped of line numbers and symbols and, and other things, if it's for 32-bit and other flags there, if it's big Indian. I guess that's deprecated, never mind. <laughs> the optional header follows that, um, and it helps a little bit with the Wikipedia pages image here. So we have the DOS header and stub at 3C. There's a pointer to the PE header, which starts here. Well, this is the signature, the PE header for Microsoft's documentation starts at the machine bytes. But anyway, following all this stuff, we have the optional header. All this is the optional header. And then we have the sections after that. And the, these sections, this array, this table of sections is what's going to be loaded in to a, a new buffer in order to load and run the program. Similarly to how I loaded ELF, it's just the layout's different, of course. So the optional header there with all the other fields starts with some magic of its own. So I can check for 20B for a 32 plus PE format, which means 64 bit. P32 is 32 bit, so we want this to be 64 bit. And this says we have the standard fields, other fields, which are kind of required, and then the variable amount of data directories. Since that's variable, we can use the size of optional header in the overall cough header field to just go past that and directly to the sections. The standard fields in the optional header. Again, we have that 20B. Linker versions, I don't care for. We have the size of the executable or text section of the program. We have the size of initialized and uninitialized data, like BSS. We have the entry point address, which is important. 
and the base of code if you need that as well. The cool thing about PE files, which makes it a little bit easier to load than the ELF files, is that the addresses for sections and the entry point are already, they're already relative. So the address of the entry point here is relative to the image base, which is a, a field in the optional header. So that means we don't have to calculate the difference between this address and the normal image base to get a relative offset like I did with the ELF file. It's already a relative offset, so that'll save some calculation there. It's a little bit easier. So the image base is normally where things want to be loaded at in memory, but I don't have to care about that for position independent executables because we'll have a dynamic image base, so to speak, where we can just allocate a buffer and that buffer will be the new image base. If it's a fixed address thing, I guess, if it's not a position independent executable, you probably should keep in mind where this is and use this image base or I guess do relocations and fix ups and things on your own to have a different one. But we won't have to worry about that. So that's good. This will have the alignment in sections, the file alignment in sections. Um, according to the spec later, I think for the section headers, they say that they should they should follow the file alignment. So as well for loading the ELF file, I had to calculate a sort of a maximum alignment value. I don't have to do that here because the sections should already all be aligned just by the format. So that's a little easier as well. The other stuff I care about here is the size of the image. So that's the overall size, including the headers or basically the maximum amount of memory that I should have to allocate for this program. Uh, you have the size of the headers if you want to know that regardless, without the sections, well, with the section headers. We could also just use this probably, but I'll probably just use size of image because it's easier as an overall sum. Subsystem it was for, usually when I make this on my Linux system, it says it's a console subsystem, but this doesn't matter. For UEFI, this would be UEFI or EFI subsystem. Um, for an EFI application, rather. DLL characteristics I will be looking at for the flags because this will say whether it is a dynamic executable or not, a position-independent executable. Size of stack, we probably... I don't know if I necessarily have to look at these, but I might in the future, depending how big the program is and how much stack and heap it's expected to use, if that can be calculated and it's in these fields, it might be a good idea to reserve enough space around the, the executable, or however you want your loader to work. It might be a good idea to reserve like a minimum of this amount of space, right? But I'm not sure. I'm not too familiar with loading, you know, advanced concepts and things. Loader flags doesn't matter. RVN sizes or data directories, but I don't care too much. But you would use that to determine how many data directories to look at. But I'm not going to worry about those. I just have to load sections, and that's it. Uh, the flags for the subsystem, if you want to know these. So UEFI will have probably just EFI application. So the number 10 will be in the subsystem field. And that's usually what I've been dealing with so far. And I've seen from just MinGW, it usually makes the character subsystem, which I guess means a CLI application. But anyway, that's regardless. Doesn't have to deal with what I'm doing. DLL characteristics, the only one of these I'm interested in here is going to be dynamic base. So if I AND that field with hex 40, that should be true for a position independent executable. So what that means is that the image base, which normally is the, a fixed address you want to load things to, that can be dynamic. So if I allocate a buffer large enough for this PE file, for this image, then the start of that buffer can be the new image base. And if this flag is set, then that's fine. It says that base can be dynamic, it can be located wherever at load time. So that's what I'm going to be looking for. These other ones I don't care about too much. Data directories I'm not going to worry about. So after the optional header, it will be immediately followed by section headers, which are all 40 bytes. They start with the name field, then they have the size in memory that it should be at, although the size of actual data can be larger, in which case you don't have to worry about it. But if virtual size is larger, than the size of the actual raw data, then it should be zero padded. For, for zero padding this, I can do it similarly to the ELF file, where if I just allocate a buffer large enough for all the sections, as long as I zero initialize that, it should take care of any discrepancies here. I won't have to worry about that too much. Yeah, the virtual address should be where in memory, in virtual memory, the section should be loaded to. And similarly to the entry point, what makes this easier than ELF loading is that it's already a relative address. 
so the address of the first byte of the section relative to the image base when it's loaded into memory. So we don't have to calculate a relative offset, we can just put it directly at this address. Well, at this address offset from the image base, which is going to be the start of the buffer allocated for the program. But you don't have to, you can save a little bit of calculation there because it's already relative. Size of raw data is the size of data. So for an ELF file, this would be the file size field. And the virtual size would be the mem size field. As well as the pointer to raw data would be uh, P address, physical address, and then V address or virtual address. Just to compare those there, so the pointer to raw data is going to be where the actual data is in the original executable buffer, and the allocated buffer to load the sections into will put it at the virtual address. So reading a section into memory is just, you take the pointer to raw data, you take the size of data at that address, and you load it to the new address up to the virtual size zero padded at the virtual address. So it's pretty simple there. You can just do a mem copy. Pointer to relocations and line numbers I don't care about too much, as well as the number of them. Characteristics I'm not going to worry about for the sections, although you can tell if it's initialized or uninitialized, if it's executable code, if it's, well, what alignment value it has, and if it's readable, writable, shared, stuff like that. So it gives you good info. I'm just not really going to care about it for my simple example, because I don't really have to at the moment. And the other parts of the PE file, I'm not really worried about. So it's really only those three sort of structs in an array. The overall cough header, the optional header, and the section header table. So that is what I have in my code. I have the cough header here, the fields that I care about from that. So the machine type, we can check if it's 64-bit, x86-64. And we can take the number of sections for, let's say, number of sections to load for programs. So that'll be the number that we're going to load in to a new allocated buffer, pretty sure. The characteristics we can use to check by ending with this mask to see if it's, I hate that it does that. <laughs> I'm pressing Shift G to see if it is in a, an executable there. We can end the characteristics field with two, pretty much. And then we also have the size of the optional header since it's a variable amount of data with depending how many very, um, data directories are there, which will be in the number of RVA and sizes field, we can also just take the size of the header and just read in and skip past the header that way. But immediately following the cough header is going to be the optional header here. It has its own magic bytes if you want to check if it's a 64-bit portable executable, which I'll probably be checking for. Size of code, initialized, uninitialized aren't too important. We will have the size of the overall image itself. So that way I can just allocate that amount of data just for a one-stop shop for a buffer. The entry point address is going to be relative, so we can just load that in as an offset from the new allocated buffer for the entry point. The image base will be the original base, but I don't have to worry about that as long as the DLL characteristics are fine. Uh, the section and file alignments should be followed by the sections, so I shouldn't have to worry about that. We have the size of the image again, size of the headers, subsystem, so DLL characteristics is probably the only other thing I'm going to worry about in this struct here. And then we can and with this mask to see if it is a portable, ex uh, a position independent executable. So if it has a dynamic image base, it should be a PI ex executable and we can check that. So after the variable size of the optional header from that size of optional header field. If we skip past it right after the optional header, it should be the section headers or the, sec or the section table. And it has its own, you know, it has the name, the virtual size address, data, raw data. So I just took the data from that Microsoft documentation page and just put them into some packed structs here. So that should be all right. Uh, if you want a tool to sort of also look at these things similarly to read elf, there's also a read PE utility that a person's made on Alpine. It is under the PEV package, but you can search for read PE and it should find it because that's the GitHub repo. But if you get that, it's uh, maybe on your repo, it's PEV or it's just, you, you would get it from this GitHub repo. It works similarly to read elf. So we can look at things there. So if I make the PE file, um, I added elf and PE to my clean. I, I didn't show that, but I added that to my make clean target, just added elf and PE. So if I make a portable executable here, 
And then I read the headers, which I think is a capital H for read PE. It prints out a bit more info and more new lines and stuff, but that's fine. It's got more info in the structs. <laughs> you can get a second opinion on stuff and just, you know, look at the format for yourself. So it should start with MZ for the overall DOS MZ header. The PE header offset is 80, so if you go to that position in the file, it should have where the COF file header is starting with, well, starting with PE00, but right after that's the COF header with the machine and everything. So the size of the optional header here is F0, which is a great game series. And I guess I did it twice? I don't know. <laughs> we know it's an x86-64 machine. The characteristics have an executable image, the line in debug info is stripped, and it can work for greater than 4 gigs, I'm guessing, from the large address awareness there. But we can check if it's an executable image on our end. Okay, and then the optional header following the COF header, we'll see we have the PE32+, plus, so it's 64-bit PE file. We have the overall size of the image, so the overall buffer size that I can load can just be this data, this amount of data. We have the image base normally, it's some high number, but I don't care if it's dynamic, which the DLL characteristics will say dynamic base, so that's good. We have the stack space we might want to look at later on, but right now I don't have to really worry about that. And it says it's a, I guess, a CLI file here for Windows character UI or console interface for the subsystem. I don't think there's anything else I have to worry about here. We should have the number of sections as well. Yeah, so there's five sections in this. We can look at the sections similarly to read elf with a capital S. I thought <laughs> it has the wrong magic bytes at the start because it's a PE file. So the sections in the portable executable, I have the regular text section here, which is the executable code. The characteristics have its, its executable code. You can execute it and read it for the memory that it's loaded to. Should have those permissions. We have read-only data, I think, is our data. So it's initialized and readable. We have P data. I don't know what P or X or I data are, but I guess they're different types of data. I guess I data is like regular dot data because it's readable and writable. And R data is just read-only like RO data, but I don't know for sure. If I make an ELF file, and I look at the sections in the ELF file, we'll have we'll have stuff like text and other things. The program bits for an ELF section would be executable code. Otherwise, we have like symbol tables and things. And the flags, I guess they explain down here. Strings, okay. And then M would be what memory merge. I don't really know. <laughs> merge is interesting. They don't have the X. Okay, they, they do execute. So text is the only one here that's executable, which is good. Do they have other stuff with like a small? I guess that's like segments maybe? Or no, those are symbols. Okay. I don't know. Anyway, we'll have similar data between loading an ELF and a PE file. I just wanted to show that. So if I go where I'm loading a PE from getting the entry point. I might have changed this message. I don't think I did though. So right now we're not going to have anything. And the PE buffer is unused. So I just making sure we have the M and Z at the start, which is the 4D and 5A. It's a PE file, it's not implemented, that's fine. Okay. So we can go on from there. Okay. So the thing the things I'll do to load a PE file would be let's say we'll print info to the user for things. So let's say print um, the cough file header info. We have the DOS MZ signature. We can print the PE signature just to make sure. We're looking at the PE file. We'll have the cough info. We'll have the optional header info. I'll allocate a buffer to load the sections into. And then maybe we can print the section info if we want. I don't know if I will, but we'll say that's there. I guess there's section headers. And then we'll load those. So load sections into new buffer, which will be allocated here. And then we'll return the entry point. So 
So similarly to an elf file, those will be basically the main sections that I'm going to do in this function here. So the PE buffer should have the loaded buffer. So the PE signature should be at 3C, or rather, something like that. <laughs> so the stub has a file offset to the PE signature at 3C. However, the data at 3C, if you go and just look at that, is not going to be the PE signature, which should be PE00. The data at 3C is a file offset to the PE signature. Usually it's hex 80 or 128. And the, the picture from Wikipedia also, 3C, it says hopefully it's a pointer to the PE header. And what that should be is this signature here for the cough header. So usually this is hex 80 contained at this position. So this would be position 128 in the file. So they don't, they don't necessarily say that here and it can be confusing if you're trying to load it. So I just want to emphasize that there's bytes at 3C and those bytes at 3C give an offset or a pointer to where the actual signature and cough header starts. So what I'm going to say is, let's say PE signature location or position. So PE sig position is going to be four bytes. So let's say we grab four bytes of data from a pointer from the PE buffer offset by 3C, but that's a void pointer, so I'm gonna have to cast that. It's a lot of cast magic here, but that's okay. So just to turn that into one byte pointer arithmetic, we'll offset by 3C, which is, you know, magic bytes here. So really I can say P signature location. Well, I'll just, maybe I'll say offset. signature offset and this is from uh, from the file format okay so if we offset that from the buffer as a one byte offset one byte aligned offset and we take the four bytes at that position which by dereferencing a four byte pointer we'll have the file offset for the PE signature and which should be PE null null and the cough header so I'll just print that out just to make sure that stuff is all right. So we can verify these things. I'll just print the four bytes there. Should be PE or, well, whatever those those data bytes are, which is what, four, five, and five, oh? And then zero, zero. I just want to make sure that those actually show up. So that would be wherever the signature position is. <laughs> I'll just say that's the signature. Okay, and if this returns null, then I'll get a key and go back anyway, so... Alright, let's just see if that shows correctly. Subscripted value is not anything nor vector. Because it's a 32-bit, okay, so... Yes, I want to get basically the magic bytes there. Um, yeah, I will. I will say this is a position then. Okay, let me make a few. <laughs> let me make another, another thing here. I'm a little confused still myself, but that's okay. So if I offset from the buffer that the data is at, I want to offset to the position that has the portable executable signature. So I'll get a pointer to that position. So I can offset from the buffer as a one byte pointer, given this position. So I could call that offset, but this is, you know what, whatever. The naming's confusing, I apologize, but anyway. <laughs> if I offset by the position that is given at the data located at this position, that should be where the magic is and the cough file header is. So if I offset by that, that'll give the the position of the PE signature, and then I can print out those values, which should be PE00. Yeah, that's what I'll try to do here. Okay, which is correct. We get 50, 45, 0, 0, which is the ASCII P and E. So that is good. Put that on its own line. Okay, so we can print the cough file header info, which will be right after the PE signature. So I called it cough file header 64. Let's say cough header, not characteristics, cough file header 64. 
So I'll grab a point or two. I can either go past this point or offset from the buffer. I'll just offset from the PE signature since that's a one byte buffer and I'm not increasing it. I can just add four to that point because it'll be four bytes after. Okay, I can also just add that as a field to the cough header, which is what usually, that's usually what people do. But since the Microsoft page didn't have that as part of the header, I didn't put it in there, but it doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter. Okay. So what info are we looking at or care about? Let's say we check what the machine type is, which should be x86-64. But I'll just make sure we can check what that is. Um, let's say number of sections, because that'll be the ultimate number of things we're going to be loading. And let's say the size of optional header U, or I guess I'll put X, and the characteristics. Put that on the next line. Characteristics. All right, put an X there, and then we can verify the data here as needed, just for validation purposes. So this will be what I call a cough header. Machine, size of optional header, number of sections, I need that. And the characteristics, okay. So I can validate things, validate some data, I guess. We can check this, so if, for example, the machine is not x86-64, I don't want to deal with this because it's not a PE32 plus file, or otherwise it's not made for the machine that I'm running this on. So you'd want to change this, you know, if you're running on ARM or RISC-V or something, you'd want to change this or not include this, this check here, but that's all right. I guess I can put error for these to mark them as errors. Machine type not AMD64. And I'll just return null for the entry point. So it stops. Okay. So I can also check the characteristics flag. So if it's not anded with the mask for executable, so if it's not anded with image file executable image, I can say file not an executable image. Fairly self-explanatory, kind of, not really, but we'll just see what we have so far for this data. Size of optional header. Okay, let's just see if we get the machine and other data for the moment. Okay. F0 characteristics, I'll put that on a new line, but oh, I also get a bunch of data as the fourth byte there, which isn't great. <laughs> I guess that's okay. So machine is x86-64, and I get some other random data, which isn't great. Um, okay. Probably because of how I'm putting data on the stack. My printf doesn't know how big things are, so it assumes this stuff is at least 32 bytes, I think, or 32 bits, if not 64 bits for each thing that I'm printing formatted. So that could be part of that. Let me put a new line there though, just in case. And that was actually at the end of the signature. Yes, yeah, so let me make sure these are, let me make sure there's enough data on the stack is all. To try to clean up that printing a little bit. Okay, 50, 45, 0, 0, that looks a little bit better. Size of optional header F0, characteristics 226. We got no errors for the machine or characteristics being executable. So that works. It's the optional header info I can print after. That'll be right after the main header. And I forgot what I called that. PE optional header 64. And I'll get a pointer to that. I'll call it opt, opt header for optional header. 
Optional hitter 64, so I'll get a pointer to, I guess I'll do the PE buffer, or I can get a pointer to right after the cough header, because that's where it will be at. So I get a, a one byte pointer to the cough header. I'll just put this on the next line so it's here. So one byte pointer to the cough header, and I'll offset by the size of that. Either the size of the data at cough header, I mean that would work. Or I can do the size of off of cough header 64. Okay. So right after the cough header will be the optional header. So I can just look at that info. And I could print this out, I suppose. Let's say cough file header. And I'll print optional header. So what do I care about here? I care about, it's probably the magic here, which should be 20B for PE32, plus for 64-bit. The entry point, probably. I won't care about the image base, because that'll be dynamic. But the address of entry point, entry point I'll care about. Section alignment, maybe. File alignment, maybe. I'll say section align. File align. I'm trying to think how many how much data this will take up. Let's do visually that is. Per line. Let's do it like this. Because I know I kind of abbreviated things a lot for the elf file. What else do I care about? The size of the image. Size of image, I'll do X. Then I'll do a new line. Size of headers, I don't care, because that'll be included in the size of image. Subsystem doesn't really matter. DLL characteristics does. We, I mean, we can print the stuff out anyway, I guess, for some of these. DLL characteristics, that's a big, long thing. And the other things I don't care about at the moment. So, okay, we'll just have those. And I'll probably put a line between these. Okay. That'll be magic. That'll be address of entry point. That'll be section alignment and file alignment. That'll be size of image. The subsystem is just called subsystem, yeah. And DLL characteristics, okay. We can validate that. If magic is not equal to 20B, then we don't have a PE32 plus file, which I care about 64-bit right now. So I'll say not a PE32 plus file. And we'll say if the DLL characteristics don't have the flag for a dynamic base, then it's not a position independent executable, and I don't want to load it because I don't want to have to worry about the image base and other relative addresses from there. So if not, characteristics and image DLL dynamic base. Say file not a yeah, I'll just say not position independent, I guess. Not a position independent executable PIE, which is probably over 25 characters. 60, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just say file not a PIE. <laughs> okay, so we'll see what that is before I go on to the sections. Just to verify, okay, so optional header, magic 20B, that's good. Entry point is at 4K, that's fine. Subsystem is not correct, because I'm not doing enough data for the stack for printf, so that's incorrect, but that's okay. Section alignment is at 4K, file alignment is at 512. The size of the overall image we need to load, so 
So the amount of memory to allocate a buffer for this is going to be 4096 times 6. So 24K. 4K times 6. Yeah, 24K. My characteristics are all right with 40 being set for the bits. Okay. So that was the subsystem, probably because that's just two bytes instead of at least four. So let me just make sure I can set it to 32 or just 64 bit. Just to make sure that prints correctly. Subsystem is three, yeah. Okay, so it's like a CLI. A character subsystem, all right. So let's allocate a buffer for this. I guess I don't have status yet for EFI status, probably not, no. So we'll allocate pool, because I don't have to worry about pages if I do that, and I'll just copy what I had for another thing. <laughs> okay, so we'll do EFI loader data. The size of data we need to allocate is going to be, I think it returns the amount of data allocated, or is that just a constant? Allocate pool. That takes in a constant there and a double pointer for the buffer. Okay. So let's make a void pointer for the buffer. I'll call it program buffer, similar to how I did the elf file loading. Then we can just give an address of that for a double void pointer. The size can be a constant. So the size, I'll just do the size of image from the optional header. Size of image. There we go. That was, yeah, that is in the in the optional headers where that is. Okay. Okay, so that's there. Loader data that. Okay, so loader data and that. Don't need the path. I'll just say could not allocate memory for PE file. It's probably okay. I don't have cleanup, I would just do, I guess, return null here as well. I don't have to worry about cleaning this up from the caller, or freeing the pool of memory, rather, from the caller, because I'm not expecting to return from loading this program. So I'm just going to leave that allocated. Otherwise, I would want to add, you know, a cleanup thing here. Okay, so the overall image should have a buffer to align, or, well, to allocate into. So section header info, I'll do that, which I called... PE section header, let's say S header or section header. I'll have a pointer to that as well. That'll be an array of section headers according to however many sections are here with the number of sections. So we'll have a loop for that. And that will immediately follow the optional header and the size of that is given in the size of optional header field in the cough header. So once again, <laughs> I can say we take a one byte align pointer to the PE buffer and we offset by the data we need to. So I can offset by the cough header or instead of going by the size of cough header, I can go by the cough header and add that size. That might be easier actually. So I can take the, the cough header and then instead of adding the size of the struct that I have, actually that'll just be at, the, at that. I'll need to do the optional header. Never mind. <laughs> If I go to where the optional header starts, I can offset from that point after the optional header by the size of the optional header, because it's a variable size. And then that'll get the position right after the complete optional header, which will be where the section headers are. Yeah, I think that's right. So size of optional header. All right, and then I'll cast that to a section header pointer. Okay. I'll put that all, well, that still doesn't fit on, on screen really, but it's very long. I'll just put it there. So the optional header offset by the size of the optional header to get right after there, that'll be where these sections are here. Okay, so we can print the names out for these if we want as well. What I can do, since there's only going to be 16-bit for the number of sections, I can just do that. And that is going to be in the cough header has, yeah, number of sections. So 
So we don't have like loadable versus other sections. I guess you could do that depending on the, the flags for like executable memory versus readable writable. I, I'm going to assume they're all loadable. We could also just load all of the elf sections and not only care about the loadable ones. That would probably have made that a little simpler as well, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm just trying to do this right now as simple as I can for PE file instead of elf loading, but this isn't going to be too bad. I'll go through all the sections and we'll just increment the section header to get to the next one in the array. And what do I want to print for those? I guess we can print the name. So I'll also print thing here. So let's say we'll say section header or sections. Section headers, that's fine. Okay, so let's do the name is going to be an ASCII, so I'd have to print it out as as UTF-16. I don't have a function for that, right? Probably not. I have a print that. I mean, I have ePrintf as well. I have S, which is a char 16T string. I could do a different printf thing, like A maybe for ASCII. That might be interesting. It's not great, and I think A means something else in printf. It would be, what is it? I think it's capital man printf. No, is it? There's a way to do that in Vim. Yeah, capital M man. Okay. So do I have percent A? I feel like I do, but I don't remember. Length specifiers, conversion. That's not taken. So, oh, wait, yeah, it is. <laughs> a is a double. I, I wanted to do A for ASCII. It doesn't matter though. And eh, whatever. I'll just do it separately here. And I'll print out the other things after. So let's say after the name, let's print out the virtual size. So vert size. We'll print out X, we'll have the virtual address. Maybe I'll just do V size and V address. And size of raw data. So I guess I'll do data size maybe. It's probably all right. And the pointer to raw data, data pointer, probably okay. And characteristics. I mean, that's really all I care about for these really. I'll probably just have those things. So the name is, I've done this before, like, I think I called it print contents, yeah. Okay, let me just copy what I have here so I don't wanna remember and mess things up. <laughs> All right, except we'll get a character position to the section header name field, which is gonna be eight bytes. I can take the address of that probably. Well, the address of a packed field isn't great. I can just convert that into a pointer. Maybe that'll be all right. I don't know. It's only eight bytes though, so that's fine. Uh, string is going to be the data at the position. One is going to be a null. If it's in, we'll print R in. Well, it's, it won't have a new line in there. We'll just print that. And if it's a null, then we'll leave. So I'll say if. Yeah. If it's a null byte, then I'll just break and, and go on. Okay. Yeah, I'll just do that. So I'll have the name, and I'll go on for the size and everything. Then that'll have a new line, then it'll do the next name and do that. Uh, actually, I'll just print a space before then. Okay, I'll see what that looks like. Probably bad. Do you mean PE buffer? I did 2296 up here. Uh, yeah, not file buffer. This would be program buffer. 
Okay, right hand operand of comma expression has no effect because I'm just doing S header, let's do plus plus. So we increment through all the sections. That would make more sense, there we go. Okay, section headers, I don't have a name, <laughs> so I'm not doing that correctly. Virtual size, address, data size, data pointer, that does not look correct, neither do the characteristics. I mean, I have an infinite loop and it doesn't like what's going on, okay. Make sure characteristics is okay. Maybe name is not correct for getting a pointer to that, I guess. Well, I can just offset the name by a thing. It's an 8-byte value, which is kind of annoying here. Uh, I guess I can take the address of that, but I think that gives an error, right? Oh, it doesn't. I thought it would. Oh, well. I thought I, I would get an error from taking the address of that, but I guess not. <laughs> okay, so we get section headers. The text, R data, P data, X data, I data. So virtual size, virtual address, which doesn't seem correct, but whatever. Data size, data pointer. I feel like those are incorrect values, probably because I'm not printing anything out for them. I don't know where my mind is. The pixies know, I don't know. Where is it? All right, virtual size. I know what I wanted to do. I was, I was seeing it in my mind, but not... Not on the paper here, so to speak. So we need data size and data address. Well, size of data, probably. No, I called it um, size of raw data, is what it is. Virtual size, virtual address, size of raw data, and pointer to raw data is what that would be. Okay, those look like better values. Virtual size, I'm still kind of iffy on for P and X data, but maybe maybe that's correct. The addresses look correct though, because they're increasing at the alignment size of 1K. Well, sorry, 1000 in hex, 4K. That seems better. Let me make sure that it is correct with read PE. No, that is correct. Okay, the sizes are actually pretty small. Okay, that actually seems to be kind of correct for the sections then. I think that's the data I'm getting. 20, 200, 600, 200, 800, A00, C00, because they're both, yeah, because 512 byte alignment means they'll increase by 200 in hex each time. That does look to be right, because they're increasing in 200 hex each time from the data size, yeah. Okay, then that is probably correct then. All right, cool. Cool beans, beans. Okay, so we want to load these sections into the buffer. So I'm going to reset the header and then go through that again. Reset the section header, that is. Because it would have been incremented after this loop. Okay. And so I don't have to take the difference in the virtual size in the row. Excuse me, so I don't have to zero pad the difference between the pointer to raw data, well, the raw data size and the virtual size. What I can do is mem set or initialize the buffer to zero. So let's say initialize buffer to zero, which should also take care of needing to zero pad sections between, let's say, raw data and virtual size. Yeah, so if I mem set the program buffer, zero, and it will be the size of the whole image, which is going to be the size of the buffer. Shouldn't have to worry about that. Okay, so then here where we're actually loading the sections, it's, it's easier. There's really not that much that goes on here. I'm just printing out info. Like, you wouldn't have to print out any of the info if you're just loading the file, you just have to load the sections down here. So it's actually not that much code. I make it look worse than it is. But anyway, we only have to load this. And really, if the pointer to raw data is above zero, which right now it is, if the size of raw data, not pointer, if the size of raw data is above zero, then 
we can load it in. If it's not, then we don't have to load any data. So later on, this might come into play. Right now, they're all probably going to be above zero. Well, they are. They are all. But if there's a bunch of, like, initialized arrays or something, stuff in the BSS section, the raw data might not be filled for a section, and we won't have to load that because I've already initialized the header here. So basically, we only care if the size of raw data is above zero for actually loading this section. Or I can say if it is zero, then we can continue. All right, so I'll do I'll do a mem copy into say source dest and stuff like that. So I've dest and source, and I'll have a length, and I'll mem copy, you know those. So dest would be, and the new buffer, which is going to be the program buffer, and we're going to offset by an amount of data. Let's offset by one byte at a time. So I want to offset into the virtual address that this is supposed to go into. Since that's already a relative virtual address, we don't have to worry about it. And the new image base is going to be the start of the new buffer. Since it's a position independent executable, that's fine. And we verified that the flag for DLL characteristics is set for a dynamic image base. So this would be the dynamic base we're offsetting from for this section. I'd load the virtual address. I'd load into the virtual address for that, offset from the new image base. I would load from the original buffer, which is going to be the PE buffer that is at the start of this function, the input buffer here. And I'd offset that by the pointer to the raw data. So that is where the actual data is located in the original buffer, and I want to put that data at the memory position it should go at in the new buffer. And the amount of data I want to put in there is going to be uh, the size of the data, so the size of the raw data. If it's not, if it's above zero, we can load it in. If it is zero, we don't have to load any data, so I can skip it. And then we'll just mem copy that in there, so that'll be all right. So it's actually really simple. I mean, we could print other data like where we're loading it to, but it's pretty simple for a PE file to just load the sections in. And of course, I'm not dealing with relocations or anything that's more complex, but that's all right. The entry point then can just be, you know, a void pointer here. And that can be at the position in the new buffer offset by the entry point. So considering the entry point and the optional, yeah, and the optional header, address of entry point, that is a relative address from the image base. Since we have a dynamic image base, that would be the start of this new buffer. So we can take the same offset into the new buffer as was in the original one, and that would be all right, because yeah, the entry point's a relative address. Then we can just return that. So that'll be okay. And then that would be returned from this function, and we should go ahead and load the function there. Okay. So I know it's small, but I don't want to blind myself when I load the thing. So we have the same section headers and everything, and we load it, and hey, it gives the same result as the elf file and as the flat binary file. So we can load a PE file, an elf file, and a flat binary, at least a very simple a quote unquote kernel that just draws to the screen, which just let's say draw square in top left. That's all this is doing. And then an infinite loop, but we can load three different types of executables. I'm not doing mock O. I guess maybe in the future I can look at that, but I haven't looked at that format and I don't I don't care to support <laughs> Max at the moment. I could though. I mean, it'd be interesting or a dot out or, or other things. I might look into that, but right now I figure the most common things will be PE and ELF, if not flat binary for uh, poops and giggles. So, okay. So I can load these three types of files. So where do we go from here? I want to get the memory map and exit boot services. So I want to do that ideally before I call this file here. So I'm going to put that here. 
and I'll have to get data for the memory map and stuff from the UEFI spec, so I'll go back to reading the spec on the next one. And we'll also fill out the parameter here. So let's say fill out kparms dot memory map with memory map info. Okay, just so I remember, but th this will be on the next one. This video is probably going to be, I don't know, two and a half hours. It'll be pretty long, but that's all right. Um, hope you enjoyed. Yeah, I have it as a to-do here as well. Hopefully this was somewhat educational or entertaining or what have you. And we can load programs if you're interested how to do basic position independent file loading. It's pretty easy when you don't have to deal with absolute addressing. So I hope you enjoyed. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and we'll get to getting the memory map and exiting services on the next one. After that, I don't know, maybe make an installer, I guess, right to a different disk. Um, and then load and boot on, like, my laptop, just for an example. But that'll be in the future. Thanks for watching. I'll see you then, and cheers.